Production funding for QED with Dr. B is provided by... Battelle cares about STEM because it was part of our founding. Gordon Battelle, our founder, believed in building an institute that would actually better society through the use of science and technology. And this year we're going to hit a goal of a million students a year that will be able to impact around the country. American Electric Power Foundation. Boundless energy for brighter futures. And by viewers like you. Thank you. I'm Dr. Frederick Burtley, scientist and president and CEO of COSI. Welcome to QED with me, Dr. B. Let's talk about science. Today we're talking about how experts are studying and reframing how we grow old. But that narrative is radically changing because the process is unpredictable. Is that correct? You're absolutely right. There's so many factors involved. Education, lifestyle, even your family. And we're just scratching the surface and really understanding what all these factors are. It's really a process of discovery. So later on in the show, we're going to look at super agers. Those are people who age really well. And then we'll talk about how experts are using artificial intelligence to increase health as we age. But first, Dr. B, what exactly is happening in the body as we age? Great question, and it all starts with DNA. And for more on that, I talked to Dr. Nosika Arnu, Assistant Professor of Molecular, Cellular, and Developmental Biology at the University of Colorado at Boulder. We're gonna get into the genetics of aging with you. Um, but before we get to that, we need some definitions here. So what is a telomere? Why do we have that on our DNA? So the telomeres are um, the ends of chromosomes. So you've all seen these little things that look like crosses. This is your chromosomes and we have 23 pairs. Every of our cells has the whole set. And at the ends of those chromosomes, there's telomeres. It's like, it's protective structure. Like you see the little thing, the little plastic thing on your shoelaces that avoid the shoelace to really fall apart. That's what telomeres are for your chromosomes. The DNA is a manual for your cells to know how to function. So every cell has all the information on how to function in that manual. Each time a cell divides, it needs to make a copy of that manual. And the copier that the cells use to do that, they cannot copy the first page and the last page. So each time the manual is copied, you lose the first page and the last page. And so telomeres are like blank pages that have been added so that you can lose pages and you will not lose any information. So it's really DNA without any information. And that's really the main role of telomeres. But what does that have to do with aging? It has to do with aging because the cell is using this shortening as a way to measure how many times it has been copied. You see, not only the manual, when it's being copied, loses the first and the last page, it also, the copier makes errors. And as you go in divisions, the manual is not as accurate anymore, and that can lead to cancer. So you cannot copy that manual indefinitely. And so, Imagine that when you remove those blank pages, at some point there's a page that says, stop, we've reached too many copies, we're going to stop here. And those cells that have reached that many copies of their DNA stop dividing, become what we call senescent, and that participates in aging. As we age, we accumulate those senescent cells that are still here in our body, but don't function as well as young cells. What specifically do those blank pages do that makes it age and then go to senescence or go to sleep? So DNA can break, and this is seen in our cells as a big problem. It's, it, it, that leads to a signal that tells the, stop, the cell to stop dividing and repair those breaks. Telomeres, because they are the ends of chromosome, they look like broken DNA, but they're not. So the telomeres tell the cells that this is not broken DNA, this, this, is, this should not be seen as a damage, but when telomeres become shortened, 
they lose this capacity to prevent the DNA damage signaling. So then they are being seen as DNA damage, and that's what sends the signal to the cell to stop dividing. Got it, and that only happens when the telomeres shorten, and that happens over time, and therefore as they shorten, they can't tell the cell to keep dividing, and voila, we have our issue. Exactly. We hear a lot in the news about how to keep our telomeres from shortening. Everything from genes, to exercise, to creams that supposedly keep our telomeres from shortening. Can you help us go through what's fact and what's fiction? Yeah, so in general, as of now, we do not have something that would safely lengthen your telomeres. The only thing that you can do is work on having a more healthy life because that has been proven scientifically. Anything that is a cream, a drug that pretends to lengthen your telomeres, I would be extremely cautious. In general, if it's too good to be true, it is. But there's been some very uh, serious studies about what causes telomeres to shorten faster. So you really have two things about telomere length is how much you inherited at birth of telomere length. So some people have longer telomeres than others, but then how much you decrease over age and stress is very high stress is showing to increase telomere shortening or unhealthy life in general so we all already know that we should live a healthy life but clearly for your telomeres it's the way to go so exercise not too much stress good eating habits and no drinking so it sounds like in general we don't want our telomeres to shorten if we prevent that artificially are there some negative downstream effects there? So yes, there are downsides because the definition of a cancer cell is a cell that keeps dividing no matter its environment. And to do that, one of the things that a cancer cell needs to do is uh, elongate telomeres, maintain telomere length. Wow, so we're stuck in this rock and hard place. On the one hand, assuming we want to slow the negative effects of aging, we want to slow how the telomeres decrease. However, if we do that, or worse, if we make them increase, that could lead to cancer. So where do we go from here with understanding telomeres? Yeah, so I think really the future of this research leads to first using telomeres in cancer cells that elongate them all the time as a target to kill cancer cells. The other thing, of course, is to find the right balance of not making your telomere lengthen because we that that would not be good but have your telomeres in check and not decreasing too fast so you can increase your health span It seems kind of simple. A healthy lifestyle should potentially limit our telomeres from shortening. But as Dr. Arnu said, there's much more to it than that. Right, the study of aging is new and involves many disciplines. Let's look at a specific type of population that ages really well. We call them super agers. And to learn more about that, we went to one of the best experts in the country, and that's Dr. Emily Rogalski, professor of cognitive research at Northwestern University. Your team studies people that you call super agers. Can you define that term for us? What is a super ager? It started with this theoretical idea that when we think about aging, um, most of the time the news is bad. We think about what's going wrong, whether it's changes in our eyesight, our hair turning gray or falling out or other external changes. But we know that also there's changes happening inside of our body, including changes in memory performance. Our memory is not as good as it used to be. And so while that's true on average, most people can also say, gosh, you would never believe my aunt, uncle, neighbor, whoever it is, they act like they're in their 30s. And so that was the theoretical premise of there are people out there who age at different rates or different trajectories. And then since we're scientists, we want to put rules around that and guidelines. And so we define superagers as people who are over age 80, 
because that means they're at the biggest risk for memory loss, but that have memory performance at least as good as individuals in their 50s and 60s. So once you've found your super agers, how do you study them? What exactly are you measuring? We say, well, what factors um, are allowing them to have that great memory performance? So we invite participants in and then they're with us for life. So they keep coming back over time. And then eventually we ask them to donate their brain at the time of death. This is critically important and might sound a little bit scary, but during life, we can see with a specific resolution. If you remember way back when, when we had the first digital cameras, everyone was excited because you could take pictures very rapidly and as many as you wanted without having to use film. But then when you printed them out on your computer, they were very pixelated. This is kind of the same resolution that we can see with during life. And so when people give that ultimate gift of donating their brain at the time of death, we can see with a better resolution. We can look at the cellular and molecular factors in a way that is much more difficult during life or just nearly impossible. So getting back to your question of what do we study when we look at superagers? We're interested in the biologic factors, the genetic factors. What does brain structure look like? We ask superagers to participate in an MRI scan. So this gives a 3D image of the brain. We ask them to donate blood so that we can look at genetic factors. Now we realize things are more complicated than these biologic factors because we live and survive and walk around and talk and have 80 plus years of, of lived experience. And we're interested in that too. So how does family history play a role? Education, lifestyle factors, psychosocial factors. So the way that we've set this up is to be really comprehensive of not looking just at these pillars, but also the integration among these pillars so that we can understand the factors that are helping people live long and live well. Well, that's incredible. I mean, you, you just described the whole ecosystem of factors and disciplines you look at. What have you found as common traits in what you're defining as super agers? We're at the beginning of this journey, not at the end, but we've already found many things that are really exciting. So when we look at brain structure, we asked a really simple question. What does the structure of their brain look like? Does it look more like the 80 year olds who they share in chronologic age with, or does it look more like the 50 year olds who they share memory performance with? And so we answered this really simple question with complex technology that allows us to look at the outer layer of the brain called the cortex and to look at the thickness of that. And what we know happens with aging is that our brain shrinks with time. And when that shrinkage occurs, it's associated with change in cognition. And when we compare the thickness of average 80 year olds to average 50 year olds, we see lots of shrinkage across the whole surface of the brain. But when we compare superagers to the 50 year olds, their brain thickness is not significantly different from that of the 50 to 60 year olds. And then we found one more surprising thing is that deep in the middle of our brain in an area called the anterior cingulate, we found that the superagers actually had a thicker part of their brain. What are your ultimate hopes from studying superagers? We see it as an opportunity to understand what are the protective factors so that we can be building up our protective factor muscles instead of just avoiding risk factors. What can the average person take away right now from your studies? So I think what our studies support um, that's really in line with larger spheres of science that have shown this as well is that relationships matter and staying connected matter. So we know that there are severe and negative consequences of social isolation and loneliness. If I was to offer one suggestion today, it would be, you know, call that friend on the way home, make that connection. For some people that might be gathering in a large group and for other people that might be calling a, a trusted friend. But whatever that means to you, that social connection is important. The other thing is that our brains like to be challenged. So often people will ask, ooh, how many crossword puzzles do you think I should do a week? And the, really the answer is, do you like crossword puzzles? Do you find them challenging? Now, if you hate crossword puzzles, cut them off. They're not helping you out because stress, especially chronic stress, we know is bad for the brain and actually has physical changes that take place to the brain. So 
finding things that you enjoy, but that also challenge you, we know to be really important for our brain and our brain health. What I found really interesting is that super agers come from all walks of life. So when you think about it, we really could be super agers, right? That would be amazing. But putting that aside, research really is reframing how we age. You're so right. And one area I'm super excited by is artificial intelligence. The sheer power of artificial intelligence to allow us to solve some immense problems is so commanding. But we can actually apply that, believe it or not, to the field of aging. And for more on that, I talk with Dr. Ranjan Nag, entrepreneur and professor in genetics at the Stanford School of Medicine. Can you first of all tell us what is artificial intelligence and how does it look different today than it did in the 80s? Now, artificial intelligence started off by looking at um, how does the brain work? How do the neurons connect it? But we didn't really have much computing power. And so in the 80s and 70s, uh, people were using what's called rule-based. So I'd sit you down, Dr. B, and ask you a lot of questions about your expertise. And we'd try and get that expertise into a computer as a set of rules, set of if-then rules. The field today is exploding with data because we've got data on the web, data on, data on TV. We've got text data, image data, video data, and we collect statistics on uh, all that data to be able to understand signals. So you speak with a certain accent, I speak with a different accent, someone else speaks with a, uh, another accent, yet uh, the speech recognition systems, for example, which is my field, is able to understand all of these accents, not by writing the rules for each one, but collecting examples of everyone's spoken words. And how can artificial intelligence increase your health later in life. Now, many of us wear you know, wearables or these watches or these bands uh, that measure everything about us. It used to be it would just measure heart rate. Then it would measure heart rate variability. Then it would measure pulse oxygen. Now you're seeing uh, these devices even measuring blood pressure. Um, and so before you'd go to the doctor once a year maybe and they'd measure your uh, uh, your heart rate and, uh, and blood pressure. Now you can go, well, I've got every single heartbeat for the last five years. With all that data again, you can actually get more information, make more better diagnoses. And the holy grail is, can you predict disease before you actually get disease? So of all these technologies um, and products, which are you most excited about? I think drug discovery. It takes about a billion dollars and 20 years to discover a new drug. As you're starting in clinical trials, right at the beginning, you only have a 5% chance of getting to the end. It's extremely risky for companies to invent new drugs. It takes a long time. And so what we use as artificial intelligence is to collect data again. Uh, can we actually develop drugs on a computer before we even start giving it to people. Can we change that 5% number to 25%? And then can we reduce the time from 20 years to three years? Using data and using drug discovery techniques, we might be able to accelerate and reduce the cost of inventing new medicines. What do you think aging will look like 20, 50, maybe 100 years down the road? Uh, I think we're, this is going to be, at least this decade, the next 20 years, is going to be the decade of bioinformatics, the convergence of mathematics and biology, uh, computing, uh, science with uh, biochemistry, creating new models. Uh, if you take 20 to 40 years, 50 years, then we're going to be looking at the convergence of machines with humans. And already we can get knee replacements, we can get deep brain stimulation, if you have Parkinson's, you get cochlear implants, we're going to have this uh, convergence of replacements of, of, of parts of the human body. There's a sort of an ethical issue, particularly in the gene editing area. Do we actually 
want to do all of those things? That are there unforeseen items that could happen by changing parts of the body? And how will we react with each other? And I think in a hundred years' time, if you can actually live to 120, 150, are you going to do the same career? Are you going to stay married for the same person for 125 years? Are you going to be able to afford to live 125 years? Society could change very, very different. Will we ever be able to upload our brains to a machine and effectively live forever? Well, let's say we could do that. Would it still be you in that machine? That would be the thing that you'd have to ask. Is it really existence if it's not connected to anything? It's not connected to a body, it's not connected to the environment. Maybe we could do that with you, extract your personality uh, by looking at all your writings, all your videos, all your books, uh, extracting all of those things, all your pictures, your home videos, your home pictures, because we have so much stuff now uh, on, our, on our phones entire life uh, is now recorded, maybe we could make a replica Dr. B uh, that's there, but would it still be you? Well, it'll have to be a lot deeper than that because what you need, the body has uh, hormones, dopamine, serotonin, emotion. I mean, I mean, how would you program guilt? How would you program jealousy? You know, it's, it's more complex emotions uh, to program. If you, it's more than just the memories and more than just the facts we'd have to actually build in uh, those emotional, biological models that happen to us as humans, but in a mathematical formalism. The, the AI that we see in the world today is not actually doing any, any understanding. When we're talking to our phone, it's not actually doing any understanding. It's just doing pattern recognition at the moment. Uh, now, could we get there? Uh, I think as computer scientists, we would like to, uh, at least see if that would be possible. And so I think we do need to think about uh, the issues of what could, what would be the implications if these things are possible. So in the not so distant future, experts say we could live to be 150. What are some of the considerations you have when you think about that? You know, it's really interesting. We live today in an age of complete technology development at super high speeds. And so what's really fascinating is between now and another 75 years, I'm sure the world is going to be completely different in ways that we can't even imagine. And while that's super exciting, it's also a little bit scary. But I'm willing to live to 150. Sign me up. So what did our experts say about the future of aging? So next 50 years is very long in terms of molecular biology. We are making so much progress that it's, it's, it's very hard to imagine. But I think really the big goal of the aging field is to increase the health span and have people still die at 90 or over 90, but live the most of their life in a very good health condition. Longevity, as you know, is the holy grail. The oldest person to have lived is 126. Um, it turns out that, uh, you know, if you went to Stone Age Man, and, um, you know, how long did they live? Well, uh, you know, the, the average age has been, uh, you know, has gone from like 36 to 78. But um, a lot of those, uh, age differences are because of the environment, because of famine, because of lack of hygiene. Uh, so we've sort of knocked off a lot of the low hanging fruit uh, with sewage systems, basic medicine, antibiotics. Uh, so we're now at that, that next stage you know, and now we're at the difficult part where we actually have to look at uh, genomic data, transcriptomic data uh, to actually say, can we get above the, um, the 126 point? My takeaway from today's experts is that aging really is a dynamic process and I'm actually looking forward to aging. I don't know if I really want to live to be 150, but I guess we'll see where the science goes. Dr. V? Well, you're better than me. I'm not really sure I'm looking forward to aging. 
But what's really interesting is there's some things that we just can't control. Your genetics are your genetics. But the good news is there are a lot of things that are lifestyle choices that we can do that can allow us to age gracefully. And that's something I'm looking forward to and want to work on. And that's QED with Dr. B. That's me. Join us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and we'll see you next time. There's a lot of stigma associated with aging. And super agers offer an opportunity to, ch to change that conversation. So there's other cultures and other places where they really celebrate individuals as they age and value their wisdom and their membership and contribution to society. Um, there's a great example of this in Zimbabwe where they have taken grandmothers um, in the community and given them a role in helping with mental health. There was a dearth of uh, psychiatrists and a high incidence of um, mental health challenge. And there would, there, they were unable to fill this gap with medical um, professionals. But what they found was by putting grandmothers on benches and giving them some training, they were actually able in a clinical trial to be as effective as those MDs in that space. And so now we have filled a gap by celebrating people um, in their aging years and changing that stigma and changing that conversation um, around what's expected in aging. Production funding for QED with Dr. B is provided by Battelle cares about STEM because it was part of our founding. Gordon Battelle, our founder, believed in building an institute that would actually better society through the use of science and technology. And this year we're going to hit a goal of a million students a year that will be able to impact around the country. American Electric Power Foundation. Boundless energy for brighter futures. And by viewers like you. Thank you.